Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. It is my great honor uh, to be selected as one of this talented 12. And I also appreciate this opportunity to share uh, with you my personal stories and my scientific adventures. Uh, my lab research has been focused on silicon-based chemistry, material science, and including the synthesis of new structures, the fundamental studies of their physical properties, and also the, their applications at either biophysical tools or biomedical devices. Um, so when I was a small kid, um, science and engineering were actually far from my mind. At the age of three, I started practicing calligraphy under the tutelage of my father. Um, however, uh, I was not a talented calligrapher, and at that time, calligraphy was all about black and white colors, and I had to follow certain standards, and of course, I need to write the correct Chinese character. So I soon became bored and found myself actually more interested in drawing and painting, where I can explore different art styles, use colors that I like, and even create objects that appear to be three-dimensional. For a very long time, I dreamed of becoming an architect or a graphic designer. But that was only before I was hit by the lightning bolt called chemistry. In chemistry, I found the elements in drawings and paintings, such as the colors, and the ease of making changes. And this freedom is counterbalanced by the use of scientific principles that guide us in creating individual molecules and materials, where the opportunities are actually endless. I was drawn to chemistry by this limited lace wheel of exploration, especially if I worked with a remarkable team of other scientists. My scientific career has been benefited tremendously uh, by the training that incorporates science, engineering, and medicine. I earned my PhD in physical chemistry and then did my postdoc in tissue engineering labs. So this image showed a so-called uh, nanoelectronics innovated engineered vascular construct, which was actually a collaborative project uh, by my PhD lab and my two postdoc labs. In this story, we uh, designed a three-dimensional three nanoelectronic system that can serve as a scaffold for various engineered tissues. And upon the formation of those hybrid constructs, the semiconductor based nanoelectronic components can actually be used for electrical sensing of the chemicals and the electric signals from the inside of the engineered tissues. So after being exposed to this variety of disciplines, I realized that there are actually still many unanswered questions and open opportunities about this semiconductor based biointerface. And we can only address those questions and those opportunities with fundamental science approaches. So in my lab, we're um, trying to use those fundamental approaches, including the exploration of new materials and establishing the new biointerface, especially at the subcellular landscape. And finally, identifying new biophysical mechanisms for biomodulation. Uh, so we chose biointerface for various reasons. Biointerfaces are not just the target of our research. They also represent a tool for discovery. Here, we have combined the biological part and the material part, let's say B and M, and we form interface MB. Then we perform fundamental studies right here in order to gain a better understanding for both parts. Now we become uh, M prime and B prime. The new information we learned from this process can be fed back into the starting components and processes. By several iterations, you actually can deepen our understanding of the entire system. So we choose biointerfaces because they naturally contain the biological components that are active and dynamic. So the biointerfaces really serve as a test bed to help us collect some unexpected source and promote discoveries. We chose silicon in our research because silicon is a biocompatible and biodegradable uh, semiconductor, and we have a fairly good control over the silicon synthesis. Not to mention that silicon is a very important material for many technically important applications. And at this stage, our uh, biointerface studies has been focused on the, at the subcellular landscape with the uh, particular problem relevant to bioelectrics and biomechanics. So today I'm going to show you just the three brief examples illustrating our approaches to combine uh, some ideas from material science and biophysics. In this first example, 
um, we showed that we can deposit atomic gold on the sidewall of the silicon nanowires. Then we can diffuse the gold to form time-dependent patterns. If we iterate this process, so several cycles of gold deposition and diffusion, and then you do a white chemical etching to remove the region that is not covered by atomic gold, then you actually can get a structure, what we call silicon spicules. And this structure displays a three-dimensional structure, anisotropy and also gradient. So you may feel that this structure looks like a spine, but I would prefer to re relate the structure to a bee stinger. If you zoom in a bee stinger, you will actually see similar anisotropic features, although they're much bigger. In the case of a bee, the stinger easily penetrates into the skin, but if the bee tries to pull it out, this, uh, the bee will simply die because the stinger has been tightly mounted into the skin tissue. And this naturally occurring material anisotropy in the tissue integration might be similarly applied to our silicon spicule case. So to verify this idea, we mounted those silicon spicule onto the AFM tip. And then we studied the force and distance properties as we approach the silicon structure into a collagen hydrogel and then retract it. We chose collagen because collagen is a model system for extracellular matrix. In parallel, we also did similar studies based on other silicon nanostructure like uh, silicon nanowire, smooth silicon nanowire, or nanoporous silicon nanowire. Statistical analysis from all those silicon probes suggests that only those silicon spicule structures with this clear anisotropy give us uh, this uh, strongest mechanical interaction with this extracellular matrix proteins. This bee st uh, stinger represents only one type of the naturally occurring hard bone material. The bone certainly is another example. The bones are considered of mineralized uh, collagen filaments, and they can modulate the activities of ostracize through the mechanical interaction. But for us, the goal is different. We hope to synthesize silicon-based uh, materials that display similar framework to bone, but eventually can be used to modulate activities of other cells like neurons. So last year, we have made one step closer to this aim. My uh, very talented graduate student, Yuan Wenjian, so he synthesized a class of nanostructured silicon, which is essentially a bundle of silicon nanowires and packed in a hexagonal array. Notably, we found that the surface modulus of this nanostructured silicon is two to three orders of magnitude less than that of the a bulk single crystalline silicon. So now you can say that this nanostructure silicon almost can be uh, treated as a deformable and or spongy material, just like some of the polymeric material. We next assembled this nanostructure silicon onto a neuron cell membrane. Then we use light to modulate the neuron activities. We'd export a biophysical process where a rapid photothermal heating through the spongy silicon can induce a capacitive current injection into the neuron cell. And given time, I won't go into those details. In this experiment, we use light with different frequencies and shine it onto the silicon cell interface. And at the same time, we use the patch clamp electrode to record the neuron activities. Here shows the result. It shows that when the light frequency is low, we obtained this deterministic neural modulation. In other words, each light pulse gives us a single action potential from that neuron. And this output is similar to that of the optogenetics, but we certainly use a complete non-genetic method. And interestingly, when the light frequency becomes higher, we got those alternating behavior. So going forward, we're interested to explore this in uh, terms of uh, uh, cellular engineering. So bee stingers and the bones, they represent the uh, uh, you can call them a skeleton, but inside the single cells, we have the cytoskeleton, which is essentially a network of protein filaments. So in this last example, I'm going to show you some of our initial effort towards building the intracellular interfaces between cytoskeletal systems and the nanostructured silicon. My former graduate student, now a postdoc at Harvard, John Zimmerman, so he studied the internalization of the silicon nanostructures into the mammalian cells, such as the endocellular cells and the smooth muscle cells. And what we found is that those high aspect ratio nanostructures were internalized into the cell 
by a phagocytosis process. And when inside the cells, the silicon nanostructures undergo a motor protein assisted active transport. And eventually, they actually form very complex interactions with both microtubule and actin filaments. Besides understanding this internalization and intracellular transport, we're also interested to explore this internalized silicon for intracellular device applications. And here, I only show you the application in terms of the intracellular force sensing. So we deliver a silicon nanostructure known as King Nanoware. And we chose the King morphology because now the material becomes two-dimensional. So the rotation and other complex intracellular transport was inhibited. And the overall intracellular force transduction will be in the form of the bending of the nanoware. So with this approach, we have used a King nanoware internalized in a smooth muscle cell and use that to report the intracellular force dynamics over a period of at least 50 minutes. And we obtained the individual force values by fitting the trajectory of the nanoware with the beam theory. Besides those biomechanics studies, we're also interested to use those internalized silicon for electric studies from inside the cell. So today I have to show you some examples of previous research and uh, current ongoing research. And in the near future, we're also interested uh, to explore all those organelle-based interfaces, including mitochondria-based interface and interplasmic reticulum. And we feel that we still have a lot of opportunities at the sub interface. And if you look at this chart, you will see why. Here, the y-axis, that's the amplitude of the different energy terms. And x-axis, that's the size or the dimension of your object. Although different energy terms, they show different dependence on size, they converge at the specific molecular and subcellular land scales. So at this regime, the energy flow among different terms becomes easier. And the biology can be fundamentally changed by some physical means, for example, electric stimulation. And in this arena, we can also say that different disciplines converge. And this is something our lab definitely hope to explore more in the near future. So finally, I would like to thank my dear group members. They have been extremely supportive over the past five years. And uh, it is really rewarding to see them uh, achieve their success in research and acquire individual scientific skills. I also would like to thank my collaborators and the various funding agencies. Um, and finally, I would like to thank Chemical Engineer News again for uh, uh, supporting me, not just for this Talented 12 event, but also for their unwavering assistance over the past almost 10 years. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, thank, I want to close my talk, and I'm more than happy to answer your question. Thank you.